Few images convey nature's wholesomeness so well as that of a babbling mountain stream. At each stone, the water whirls and draws in air. The water breathes. In the spiraling of water, the Austrian natural scientist Victor Schauberger recognized a basic form of movement in nature. His aim was to imitate the spinning movement in technical devices and thus produce naturally inclined, environmentally friendly energy. Schauberger developed revolutionary propulsion units with which, for example, aeroplanes are not pushed but drawn forward. Victor's son, Walter Schauberger, searched for a mathematical formula to explain his father's findings. He designed a funnel based on the hyperbolic spiral in which the stream of falling water formed a dramatic spiral pattern. Seen from above, it looks like a spiral nebula in space. Further down in the hyperbolic Schauberger funnel, the pulsating double helix reminds us of the DNA spiral. A coincidence? The turbulence creates a stable pulsating structure out of swirling chaos. A pattern of natural self-organization there for us to understand and then copy in Victor Schauberger's view. Faithful to the silent forests was the maxim of his ancestors. Victor Schauberger was born on the 30th of June, 1885, son of a forest superintendent. The house where he was born in Holzla, in the Mühlviertel region of Upper Austria. Victor attended forestry school and graduated in 1904. In remote districts, Victor could observe the woods in all peace, areas as yet untouched by humans. His observations over many years in this natural environment crucially shaped his later life's work. From early on, the forester turned his attention to the mountain streams and to the trout in them. Victor Schauberger recognized that the fish do not only swim against the stream, but that the water itself can flow in opposite directions. He himself started to go against the tide of current doctrine. Simple forester that he was, Victor, here with his wife Maria and son Walter, was soon to astonish the scholars. The border between Austria and the Czech Republic runs not far from the house where he was born on the edge of the Böhmerwald Wood. Over many kilometers, the Schwarzenberger Schwemmkanal marks the national border. In Victor's youth, wood was transported down this stream to the Danube, where it was loaded onto ships. However, the channel could not carry entire tree trunks, but only logs. Victor Schauberger was to become well known for his logging flumes with a much greater carrying capacity. This small pond is what remains of a storage lake. A few years ago, it was still full of water, Lake Taschel. And 80 years ago, innumerable felled trunks floated in it, especially in the spring. In 1929, a documentary was filmed here. The forester Schauberger used his knowledge of the powers inherent in water to build a modern logging flume in the Mertz Valley in Green Styria. Approaching the weir from the valley. Beneath the intake gate, a steep chute accelerates the departing timber. In 
In man-made channels, heavy trunks floated down to the valley, even logs heavier than water. How was this possible? The first intermediate dam is reached. Due to the fact that cold water carries better than warm, the water that's been warmed up by sunlight, velocity and frictional force along the way has to be replaced by new cold water. Today there are only ruins left from the intermediate dam. But Victor Schauberger became well known for his logging flumes far beyond the Austrian borders. Similar log chutes were built to his designs in former Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. It is not documented whether this man with the flowing beard is actually Victor. Final destination, the sorting plant in Neuburg on the Murz, another little marvel. The big trunks slide over a drop and the smaller ones fall through. The lumber plant at Neuberg on the Murz is going to be partly rebuilt for demonstration purposes. This is worthwhile because, as a construction for water regulation, it was unique in the world. In the only sound document of Victor Schauberger's from the year 1955, he explains the most important underlying principle. Dann erreiche ich den Manomalitzustand, die, die höchste Dichte, die größte äh, Schleppkraft, das Wasser fängt zum Ziehen an und damit habe ich das erreicht, was ich beim Schwämmen auch wollte. But what did Victor mean by moving in a certain way? His grandson Jörg Schauberger offers further details. These logging flumes all meandered down to the valley. There were further structures along the way which swirled the water within the channels. This enabled the water to carry even heavier loads. Many people have tried to build similar structures, but my grandfather's logging flumes were the only ones that really worked. Victor Schauberger received many patents for aspects of his logging flumes, as well as for natural watercourse regulation devices and for the guide vanes that divert the water into the middle of the river, preventing damage to the banks. In the Pythagoras Kepler School in Bad Ischl, Victor's grandson Jörg and his wife Ingrid have held numerous courses and workshops on the topic The Nature and Movement of Water. In his own way, Victor Schauberger analyzed the meandering movement of a natural watercourse and described it in detailed drawings. His conclusions are valid for all rivers. However, Victor's unorthodox proposals for regulation of the Rhine and Danube were ignored by the experts. Even on a smooth window pane, water doesn't flow straight down but starts to meander. A pulsating space curve develops. According to Schauberger, a river doesn't just flow, but winds itself forward. A river rotates in its bed. Put simply, it swirls. In the bends, the current is fiercest, ripping up and grinding the boulders in its bed. In Victor's words, the river chews up its stones. The minerals contained in them are food for the water. When the turbulence diminishes, the sediments slowly settle down again. Where the river deposits the most, a ford is formed. Now the river starts to curve the other way round and accelerates its space curve until the next opposite bend appears. Victor Schauberger called this alternation between the left and right hand curves with fords in between a curve or river generator. The Swedish engineer Olaf Alexanderson, now 90 years old, published the first book about Victor Schauberger in the 1970s. He is still investigating the river generator. What the 
dann habe ich mir gesagt, dass vielleicht... And then I said to myself, if a charge has built up here, then maybe it can be measured with an ammeter. And then I inserted a copper plate here, which was firmly soldered to a cable, and here another plate. I used a copper cable about 10 meters long. I got a registration. Here I had a pulsating direct current. It was a generator. I also measured in a straight stream, and there it was very bad. It was like a dead river. There were long stretches that had no charge at all. According to Schauberger, temperature variations are crucial for the energy processes in a watercourse. Even the slightest differences in temperature cause the different layers in the water to flow faster or slower. The water rubs against itself, bringing about ripples and vortices. A positive consequence is that the river slows itself down. In 1930, the Austrian Academy of Sciences confirmed the receipt of a sealed envelope entitled Turbulence. In it, Schauberger described his theory about the interdependence of water temperature and movement. The Academy kept the document under seal for 50 years. A confession that the time was not yet ripe for unlettered Schauberger and his practical perceptions from nature. Thanks to the distinguished work of the Styrian hydraulic engineer Ottmar Grober, this has since changed. Here we have a river bank that was protected massively against floods. But Viktor Schauberger said one regulates a river through itself from its center. Normally, hydraulic engineers shore up the riverbanks with stones. Grober does it differently and, incidentally, more cost-effectively. He places the boulders in a river, like here in the Salza. The stones are deposited to form a chute. And then Grober had the idea of building an even larger chute in the longest river in Styria, the Moor. The rocks, each weighing a couple of tons, are mechanically placed into the riverbed at low water. Gorber is a professional and monitors the position of the rocks with a GPS. The rocks have to be accurately placed if the chute is going to fulfill its purpose of drawing the water away from the banks to the center of the stream. This chute was designed and built with unconventional methods in that it is the first scheme to be built from the inside out to direct the energy from the banks towards the middle. That means that I don't have to destroy or disturb the banks at all, as all of the work is done in the river itself. Building the channel not only stabilizes the banks, but also improves the water quality. Gruber doesn't see himself as a river manager, but rather as a river liberator. His chute accelerates the water in the middle of the stream. The riverbed is then eroded by the increased flow velocity in the middle. And this again results in uneven depths in the middle of the river. And so the large Huchen, also called the Danube salmon, which live here, are able to find a habitat that corresponds to the needs of their species. That means different water depths with different flow velocities. At normal water levels, the boulders are no longer visible. The funnel-shaped current, though, is recognizable. At low water, the channel becomes clearly visible. Shortly after the construction, Gorba had the current measured with a hydrometric vein apparatus. Further measurements were taken by Graz University of Technology. 
The measurement data ended up with Christina Zindela at the Institute of Hydraulic Engineering and Water Resources Management. She is a mathematician and, as part of her doctoral thesis, is working on the complex flow conditions in Grober's hydraulic constructions. We have completed several trials and noted the changes to the riverbed. Here you can see a cross-section before the construction of the channel. You can see that it's pretty even. After the installation of the channel and after a tremendous flood, the riverbed changed like this. You see here very strong dynamics within the riverbed. In this area, potholes were formed that are very good for the fish, because here they find calm resting places. And what is more, the riverbank stayed sound, so it was safe from the flood water. The profile of the Moor riverbed after it has been changed by the channel now looks like a natural river profile, as drawn by Victor Schauberger in the 30s. Christina Zindela does not just sit at the computer. Here she takes precise measurements at another of Ottmar Gorba's river construction sites. In the Stubmingbach brook he built a kind of stairway, a pendulum channel a new building method for managing a steep gradient in which the sections of the riverbed restore its original swinging movement to the water. With floods, it swirls inwards, and instead of the swinging movement, it develops a flowing plume, a plait of water. That means that I have a convex flow pattern, Contrary to the conventional chutes, where you have a concave flow profile that attacks the banks on its edges. This is going to be tested now at the Hydraulic Engineering Laboratory of Graz University of Technology, with a 1 to 10 scale model. It is 3 meters wide and 18 meters long. After it is built, there will be a series of tests, for example flood simulation. For the first time, Schauberger's methods for the regulation of flowing water are going to be subjected to sophisticated tests at the renowned Institute of Hydraulic Engineering. The head of the institute is Professor Gerald Zenz. We would like to find out more about nature, especially nowadays, when we attach particular importance to the natural environment, to natural water runoff, and we have a specific scientific interest in considering energy flow. And so we are completely in tune with Schauberger when we say we want to find out how nature works. We want to study and learn about different volumes of water, its effect on the stability of the riverbed. Can we let different quantities of water generate energy in a controlled way? As engineers, it's our job to make things safe, so that even with floods there is no danger. The river and its banks are not damaged and the population is safe. In practice, the pendular chute has already proved itself. The tests on the scale model are to give us a sound scientific basis, not least for the construction of more new channels. On the Großen Tulln, near the Wienerwald in Neulenkbach, an old weir system is to be replaced by a pendular chute as part of the restoration project. This will enable the fish to move freely through the waters again. And at the same time, a forest is planned on the floodplain. And in this alluvial forest, a Viktor Schauberger Park is to be established. A pendular chute in a Schauberger Park would be the crowning achievement of Ottmar Grober's professional career. Here he analyzes the electromagnetic frequencies in the water of the pendular chute with a new measuring instrument. Different aspects of his hydraulic engineering measurements have already been the subject of theses at the Graz and Braunschweig University of Technology. The time finally appears to be ripe for a Schauberger-style river regulation system. Very early in his career as a forester, Victor Schauberger recognized the great significance of the woodland in the never-ending water cycle. 
According to Schauberger, temperature differences play a crucial role in this process. In the shade of trees, the forest soil stays relatively cool. When warm rainwater hits the cooler soil, it sinks into the ground more easily, replenishes the water table and comes back up to the Earth's surface some time later. It evaporates, clouds form and then rains down again. Schauberger calls this the complete or full water cycle. But the full cycle is increasingly disrupted, for example by forest clearance. Without the tree covering, the ground is now warmer than the rain falling onto it. The rainwater does not penetrate into the ground, but flows along the surface into brooks and rivers, causing floods. On the other hand, the water table sinks. In summer, this surface water often evaporates from there, causing clouds to form and so leading to more rainfall. One flood leads to the next. Schauberger calls this the half-water cycle. On a hot plate, it can be seen in a dramatic demonstration how the drops of water roll off. In a similar way, it can also be observed on hot asphalt. Today, this is known as the problem of sealing of natural surfaces. Today, basically, water goes through only half of the water cycle. It can no longer penetrate into the ground, stay there and regenerate. Viktor Schauberger wanted to solve this problem mechanically and so developed a machine for the production of spring water-like drinking water. In 1935, he obtained a patent for it. In this machine, the water would go through the whole cycle again the water is cleaned, cooled down, run through vortices, enriched with minerals, and then it comes out of the machine like fresh spring water, like the water we know from our mountains. Victor Schauberger believed that without a healthy woodland, there is no healthy water, which he called the blood of the earth. The shade-giving canopy of natural mixed woodlands allows an incomparable variety of species to flourish in the understory. A thick humus layer develops. A good woodland soil is a good water reservoir. It can retain up to 90% of the rainwater that falls upon it and so dramatically reduces the risk of flooding and erosion. A healthy woodland soil can absorb six times more water than bare ground. The cooling shade of the trees is just as important for a river. If humans do not interfere, the shade providers grow by themselves on the riverbanks. Victor Schauberger was probably one of the first people to talk of the dying forests. As early as the 1920s, he warned about radical deforestation and the replanting of trees in plantation monoculture. It is a tragic consequence of Victor's life's work that his ingenious water channels led to the massive deforestation that took place in Austria and elsewhere. If one cuts a swathe into the wood, then the trees which were previously in the middle of the wood immediately become border trees. They are suddenly exposed to direct sunlight and their bark gets scorched. These border trees are badly damaged. This was a problem that Victor Schauberger also described. Is it a coincidence that the soil is dry at the edge of this wood? As with river regulation, Schauberger's insights into forestry are more relevant than ever. From forestry, it is only a small step to agriculture. Victor Schauberger saw a cause of declining yields in agricultural machinery made of iron. Basically, Victor considered the formation of rust in the water or the soil to be a life-destroying process. For this reason, he turned to the noble metal copper. Victor and his son Walter Schauberger obtained many patents for agricultural implements made out of copper. Instead of rust from the iron, copper and copper alloys contain trace elements which are brought directly into the soil through abrasion. Susanna Niedermeyer has been using copper tools in her garden for several years. 
On a small scale, she observed similar results to those documented in the 1940s in large-scale field trials in the Salzburg region and the Tyrol. An increase in soil fertility. Susanna Niedermeyer tests the spade, comparing an iron spade and a copper spade. Well, with the copper spade, I have to say, it just goes into the ground more easily. With copper tools, it seems that the trace elements also get into the soil. It seems to me that the soil in the whole garden has become homogeneous, so we don't have so much trouble with snail damage. It simply makes the work a lot easier. I recommend it. Victor Schauberger developed a special plough for loosening the soil which turned the soil inwards, centripetally, rather than outwards, centrifugally. Unfortunately, there is only one model of the spiral plough, also known as the bio-plough. Klaus Rauber of the Association for Implosion Research in the Schwarzwald explains how it works. With his bio-plow, Victor Schauberger copied the way of a mole, faithful to his principle, comprehend and copy nature. This plow works like a mole, which moves the soil centripetally and so moves through it with hardly any resistance. Electron microscope photographs have recently shown that shark skin has a similar structure, enabling the shark to plow its way through the water with hardly any frictional resistance. Victor Schauberger certainly had not seen such pictures in his time. This plough turns the soil twice, first by turning it at this edge and then turning it back again so that the layering of the earth remains intact. The merits or demerits of ploughing in agriculture is ever more frequently debated. Victor Schauberger's backwards turning plough could be the way to leave microorganisms in the soil layer where they belong. The Kudo antelope horn is an outstanding ear trumpet for sound amplification. But Victor Schauberger was interested in another characteristic. For him, the Kudo horn was the ideal model for water pipes because of its twisted spiral shape. In many countries, Victor and Walter Schauberger obtained patents for their spiral pipes. Such pipes are not easy to make. Felix Hediger of the Association for Implosion Research heats up copper pipes in order to bend them. With a roller he made himself, he can twist the now flexible copper pipe. Another variant is a pipe which is not twisted, but dented, the so-called Neumann pipe. Despite the fact that the pipe is straight, the water whirls in on itself. The water flows in a spiral space curve. In Victor Schauberger's view, the ideal water flow pattern. The Association for Implosion Research produces not only spiral pipes, but builds whole apparatuses following Victor Schauberger's original plans. Here is the latest version of a sophisticated water appliance to revitalize distilled water from the year 1958. With this sophisticated device, Victor Schauberger attempted to combine several technical aspects. He built a small-scale wave diaphragm. There the water pulses through and meanders in the same way as it does in a natural water course. The hole is covered by a lid so that light is excluded. Carbonic acid is added to the airspace. The carbonic acid is incorporated into the water during the vortexing process and high-quality salts are also added to it. The entire process has to run approximately half an hour with a positive temperature gradient. That is, the water has to cool down to 4 degrees Celsius. After half an hour, the water is taken out. It should rest a day until it has the maturity of good spring water. Possibly even, we'll test this in experiments, the maturity of healing water. 
Back to Felix Hediger. He builds his spiral pipes into a huge water revitalizing machine. It is not yet finished, but parts of it are. The hyperbolic funnels are already used in many ponds. The whirling air bubbles reduce the formation of algae in the pond, like on this golf course in the Taunus near Frankfurt. There is also a smaller funnel, a tabletop unit for enlivening drinking water. Jens Fischer has conducted numerous Schauberger Vortex experiments. He sells the first water vitalizing equipment, which has been produced in great numbers since 1980. The so-called Martin Whirler was developed after a suggestion to Victor Son Walter by a hydraulic engineer. Several thousand devices are also in use in different applications. Numerous bakers report the improved rising of dough and the retarded mould development. The whirler has also been used in hydrotherapy for many years. According to medical opinion, the world water can relieve tensions in the neck and shoulder areas as well as ease rheumatic pain. The patients are treated with water that has itself been treated. The water treatment appliances that Victor Schauberger built himself in the 30s were likewise used successfully for therapeutic purposes. Unfortunately, none of the devices from his water laboratory have survived. At the Schauberger Congress in Hör in Sweden with participants from 15 nations, Klaus Rauber and Jörg Schauberger demonstrated the functionality of Victor Schauberger's original suction coil. A kind of pump that sucks the water rather than pushing it. The water is carried smoothly as its flow is not interrupted by paddles. The Swedish hosts have specialized in vortex appliances. They make use of the reciprocal pressure and suction effects within the vortex for different applications. But then, Murphy's Law comes into effect. After the camera is dry again, a visit to nearby Malmo. Jörg Schauberger meets his Swedish friends. In the background is the new Malmo landmark, the Turning Torso, a twisted multi-storey building. Although this building behind me doesn't have anything to do with Schauberger, it still makes me happy to be able to show how something so alive, like a turbulence, a twist, can be made out of something so rigid. Here in Sweden, Malmö is the home of a group which intensively investigates water turbulence. Research into Schauberger and the Vortex is well established in Sweden. Because here, Olaf Alexanderson wrote his book, Living Water, one of the standard works about Viktor Schauberger. Here, the legendary IET Malmö group, Kurt Halberg and friends, have continued their researches and they're very close to new discoveries about vortexed water and its applications in everyday life. Kurt Halberg and Anders Eva demonstrate in the laboratory how a Whirljet nozzle can add air into water already at a low pressure. This process is also reversible, to remove air from the water. The jet nozzle has a hyperbolic form and generates a very strong vortex. The air bubbles are drawn into the center. Then a vacuum is created in the center of the vortex. The jet nozzle has proven itself in practice. The vortex generator is built into a cylinder and marketed by the company Watrico, created for this purpose. Small, small bubbles in the, in, uh, the water floats towards the center as the, the uh, rotation will generate a sub-pressure. This is very beneficial for an example making ice, as uh, the ice that will be made or frozen by the water treated with the vortexer uh, will have less air inside. It's very good also for altering the uh, uh, 
floating tendencies of water or the dynamic viscosity. As the water floats better out on the ice, filling cracks and pores, uh, especially when you are uh, in an ice arena where people are skating and uh, there's a lot of stress on the ice. In this ice rink, a Watrico vortex generator is attached to the water pipe. Degassed tap water flows into the water tank of the ice preparation machine. The new ice is denser and more resistant, so it lasts longer. This also saves energy. Water is normally heated up to make ice, since one of the many anomalies of water is that warm water freezes more quickly than cold water. Before we had installed the system, the water needed to be heated up to 45 degrees. Sometimes some people use 55 degrees. And as you put out uh, around 10 cubic meters every day, this means that uh, a lot of energy is put into heating 10 cubic meters from, say, 10 degrees from the tap water up to 45 degrees. Today we use only 20 degrees, which means actually you have cut the, the energy costs uh, by 50 percent. Small wonder then that several ice making machines run with vortexed water. The real ice technique of Watrico has been installed so far in 25 ice rinks, 20 of them in Sweden. Back at the Schauberger Congress in Hör, the American Dan Rees presents his vortex machine. It consists of a series of linked cylinders and purifies the water without any chemicals whatsoever. Uh, I read Living Waters. This is how I got into this. I read a book called Living Waters by Olaf Alexanderson, and Victor Schauberger was the main person in this book. And he, uh, he wanted clean water for everybody. First, Reese uses the vortex tubes to remove iron and sulfur from the groundwater in his native Texas. Now he is trying to desalinate seawater with this energy-saving technique. I know it's possible. It just, uh, it's just a matter of time now. Uh, we're, very, we're, we're pretty close. Uh, uh, just getting a chloride removal is very close. Dan Rees has left one machine there. The Swedish team has installed new jet nozzles in order to optimize the development of the vortex. In Malmö Yacht Harbor, Kurt Halberg pumps seawater into a large can. In the laboratory, the water runs through the vortex tubes. With the initial trials, they achieved a significant reduction in the salt content and also the pH value. In the 1930s, Victor, and later his son Walter, experimented with the so-called Kelvin generator. When falling through copper spirals, thin strands of water produce high electrical voltages. Tiny water droplets suddenly change their direction of fall, contrary to the laws of gravity, and move back upwards. This levitation is a phenomenon that had already been investigated in the 19th century by the Nobel Physics Laureate Philip Leonard at waterfalls in the Alps. The tiniest water droplets carry an electrostatic charge. They form a very fine spray that can easily be seen and inhaled. Waterfalls have a positive effect on human health, particularly easing asthmatic complaints. Although over 10,000 volts was generated in the water thread experiment, no significant electrical current was produced. Victor and Walter Schauberger halted their experiments into alternative energy generation. In the beginning of the 1950s, they started a new approach, based on the spiral pipes. They had already used these as the optimum curved shape for their water channels. In 1952, Victor Schauberger's patented spiral pipes were tested at the Stuttgart University of Technology, the legendary purple experiment. 
Schauberger's frequent attacks on academic science, especially on water resource management, caused a number of politicians to commission Professor Purple to test Schauberger's pipes. The aim was to confirm or disprove Schauberger's ideas once and for all. For these measurements, Schauberger provided Franz Purple with some pipes. Amongst others, there was a straight copper pipe, as well as a double-coiled spiral pipe. The aim of these measurements was to test and compare the vortex flow processes within the pipe, in order to determine whether or not this shape of pipe enables the water to pass through with reduced friction. With these measurements, the relationship between friction and the flow velocity within the pipe was determined. There were clear differences between the straight and the spiral pipe. With the spiral pipe in particular, a sort of critical resonance point was discovered, at which the water flowed through the pipe without any apparent resistance. However, some interpolations were made which, at a closer look, would not stand up to scientific investigation. In his preliminary investigations, Professor Purple didn't take enough measurements, especially around those fascinating resonance points. For this reason, the Association for Implosion Research decided to set up the experiments again and repeat the tests. At the time, however, Victor Schauberger was encouraged by the Purple report to make the spiral pipes the core of his own energy machines, for example in his home power station from 1955. This allows energy to be produced from water and air. For Victor Schauberger, conventional explosion technology was the technology of death. With his home power plant, he hoped to stimulate atomic conversion processes through implosion, fulfilling the dream of a non-polluting energy converter that is economical with natural resources. Water jets of enormous force develop in the spiral pipes. But on the very first test run, the pipes burst. A second prototype was drawn up by Victor's collaborator Scherio and built later in Canada. Now this suction turbine has been brought to Germany for closer investigation. Firstly, it's powered by a motor until it reaches a working speed of rotation. After this, water is run into the turbine and the tangential rebound of the water jets with these nozzles causes the rotor to turn by itself so that the drive suddenly starts to run on its own, generating enough electricity to supply a household. The regulation for this entire process is in the lower section. The water flow is controlled with this nozzle. With this small knob we regulate the power output of the generator. Here we have the intake vents. In the center of this fixed part is an ascending coil with a built-in suction coil, another core piece of Schauberger's machines. But first, several components have to be revised and adapted, especially the links between the motor and the generator. Only then can the turbine be accelerated gradually up to 3,000 revolutions per minute. July 2007. At a convention of the Association for Implosion Research, Jörg Schauberger and Klaus Rauber unwrap a long-lost piece of equipment. It is the last Repulsin that Victor Schauberger ever built. In 1958, it was lost in America. The Repulsin was constructed at the time of the miracle weapons of the Third Reich and became a legend after the war. One specimen allegedly took off from the workbench and shattered on the ceiling. From this story, the mythology grew that Victor Schauberger had built the first flying saucer. But what really was the Repulsin? According to a technical drawing of the prototype from 1940, the Repulsin could, among other things, silently power an aeroplane without the need for fuel. A look into the interior of the first Repulsin, a replica that was found in the cellar of the Pythagoras Kepler School in Bad Ischl. In the turbine there are two wavy plates, one on top of the other. 
air was drawn in through the gill slits between the two plates. Here, Victor Schauberger wanted to mimic the energy processes that are generated in the curves of a riverbed. And then the air is sucked in here through the slots and brought into the diaphragm inside, so that the air flows round here in a circle. Now we just remove the ring so that we can see it a little more easily. Here the air escapes between the discs and is rotated with these earlobe-shaped guide vanes. Schauberger's central approach here was the principle of matter transformation. The elements of the air, particulate matter and gases are converted in this repulsator, which is what we call the core of this repulsin. With this transformation, the different elements group together and are separated out. One part escapes through the ring rotator. And the radiation energy, Schauberger talks about synthesis electricity, is emitted through the central axis. That's why he also planned to incorporate this machine in aeroplanes as an alternative to the propeller for propulsion. Basically, the repulsion creates a biological vacuum along the axis in front of it, into which the aeroplane is sucked. Like the trout that's basically sucked through a vortex. A revolutionary propulsion concept. The question of what happened to Victor Schauberger's last repulsing becomes even more interesting. In June 2002, the American Richard Feierabend appeared unexpectedly at a seminar in Bad Ischl. He showed pictures of the repulsing which he had rediscovered in Texas. Feierabend was a US Marine pilot. Colleagues had told him the mythology surrounding Victor Schauberger's flying discs. One of the speakers at the same seminar was the Englishman Callum Coates. He and Feierabend got to know one another as Coates had written the first English language book about Victor Schauberger. Callum Coates is an architect and Schauberger researcher who lives in Australia and who translated numerous of Victor's texts into English. Victor's wording was specific and very often difficult to understand, so it was a tough undertaking. In the chapter, What Happened in America, Coates reconstructed the exact events of the summer of 1958. In the Schauberger archive in Bad Ischl, Ingrid Schauberger presents Victor's correspondence from that time. These are the last original documents from Victor Schauberger's life. With this knowledge, his grandson Jörg went to America in April 2004. First stop was Fredericksburg in Virginia, the home of the Feierabend family. Richard Feierabend had unfortunately since died. Jörg Schauberger was welcomed by his widow, Patty. Patty Feierabend showed all the documents which her husband had been able to secure and which have not yet found their way to Europe. Here are all the original documents that Dick Feierabend collected from Texas. I'm very surprised about the abundance of the material. One can see here some original photographs, as well as the legendary Purple Report, the paper that was written at the University of Stuttgart in 1952. We've seen copies of it, but this paper has the original signature of the professor on it, so it's also of great interest to Schauberger research. Tell your mom, hello, Ingrid, hello, children, hello. It was already late when Jörg Schauberger said goodbye to Patty Feierabend, but he had not yet seen the repulsing. The journey continued the next day to Austin, the state capital of Texas. Jörg Schauberger visited an institute that specializes in future technologies. The research ranges from cold fusion to so-called zero-point energy. Its client list includes the American space agency, NASA. Well, 
And here it stands on the test bench, Victor Schauberger's Repulsin from the year 1945. Richard Feyerabend had brought the machine back to Texas shortly before he died. He wanted to know whether it could produce a lift, in other words, overcome the force of gravity. Hal Puthoff, head of institute and a renowned experimental physicist, showed Jörg Schauberger the test stand. Puthoff's colleague, Scott Little, used a stroboscope lamp to test whether the material would be deformed with a rising speed of revolution. At 2,000 revolutions per minute, the tests were aborted. There was concern that the half-century-old machine would fly apart. I must say, one of the things I was impressed with was uh, the quality of the construction, considering it was from the 40s and uh, for example, when we put it on its bearings and spun it around, it spun very freely, as, as good as any modern bearings, actually. And so uh, I could see that its uh, function was to generate some kind of vortex airflow. And so what we wanted to do is look to see if, uh, when it was spun at high speeds, <coughs> whether it would generate any, any lift. And what was the result of your test? Unfortunately, uh, we didn't uh, see any lift. Now, <coughs> there are two aspects of this that we wondered about after the fact, and that is we only had pictures of the device uh, before we received it, and there were at least two parts of the device that uh, were not provided us. One of the parts we had pictures of, photos of, and so we were able to fabricate that uh, part of the device to add to what was sent to us. And then there was another smaller camp that we had no information on its structure. It wouldn't look like it would pay, play a major role, but you know, we can't be sure. So when we didn't see a good effect, we didn't know if perhaps uh, we were still missing a significant part. Like this. For the first time, Jörg Schauberger saw the interior of his grandfather's last repulsing. What is his conclusion? Well, what we had hoped for from Schauberger's flying saucers did not happen, unfortunately. But it has to be said that not all the parts were there. Victor Schauberger had said that the catalysts in particular were essential for his machine to move in a way that corresponds to nature, and these were missing. We should have been able to obtain energy without wasting resources, with machines that run on only water and air. We'll see what comes out of this. So, it will be back to the drawing board for a while before we can publish new findings. Jörg Schauberger has a different aim at the moment. He is following his father and grandfather's footsteps to the Texas-Oklahoma border, to the Red River of Western movies. On the 1st of July 1958, Victor boarded an aeroplane from New York to Dallas, Texas, accompanied by his son Walter and his son-in-law, Dr. Walter Lueb. Some American business people had invited them to stay, especially the German-born American Karl Gersheimer. He saw that there was no future in explosion technology. He had heard of Victor's concepts of virtually free energy production. He wanted to develop and market these ideas in the land of opportunity. With the backing of a wealthy US financier, the project could start in Texas. So in the summer of 1958, Victor and Walter Schauberger came to a remote semi-desert area in the north of Texas. 73-year-old Victor had difficulty with the oppressive heat but he hoped to be able to complete his life's work here. Grandson Jörg looks for clues. The only photograph of his father and grandfather together in Texas.
Jörg goes on to Denison, the birthplace of the former US President Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is a postcard of the house President Eisenhower was born in. It shows the house as it looked in 1958 when my father wrote this card to us back home. It was July 1958 where he wrote, We're doing really well. We're in high spirits. So that was the beginning of the expedition to the USA, my grandfather's and father's American adventure. Jörg drives into the small town nearby, Sherman. Karl Gersheimer had a business associate here, Harold Totten. He owned a foundry that produced tubes and drill pipes for oil and gas production. The firm is still owned by the Totten family and is still called the Washington Iron Works. When I got out of the car and walked into the office of the Washington Iron Works for the first time, I felt a little uncertain. We tried to get in touch via email, but we didn't receive an answer. So I wasn't sure what kind of welcome I'd get. But the chief executive of the firm was friendly, and Jörg could move freely around the factory. He found the old factory shed where Schauberger's machines were to be built. Unfortunately, this never happened. The prototypes from Austria arrived only after a two-month delay and were not handled with care. A few pieces ended up later in Karl Gersheimer's garage, where they were found by Richard Feierabend many years later. Wally Totten, the current boss of Washington Ironworks, showed Jörg his manufacturing plant, where they make precision parts out of aluminium. Wally Totten can still remember Victor Schauberger very well because of his full beard, which reminded him rather of Santa Claus. As he was a trainee at that time, he could not remember the project itself. His father told him some details later, especially about Karl Gersheimer, the initiator of the project. My grandfather and my uh -huh. father? Yes. Um, and? My father was very bitter about the way Karl handled particularly the relationship because he, he really felt that uh, Carl was the one that, that caused the project not to work. Uh, uh, and nobody really knows why, but uh, m my father was, uh, was very, very uh, uh, convinced that Carl was, uh, uh, was a very negative influence on that, on that whole situation. And as I say, was a, Carl also seemed to spread some some distrust amongst the other people. Jörg Schauberger is not surprised because he knows that the Texas project ended in a fiasco. After a few weeks, communication problems and misunderstandings led to the breakdown of mutual trust. Victor refused to stay here in Texas any longer than three months. In this diner, Victor and Walter Schauberger used to have their breakfast. Afterwards, boss Wally Totten takes Jörg in his Porsche to his family's former country home, about 10 kilometers outside Sherman. This is where the Austrian inventors stayed. The Totten family sold the property some 20 years ago. Today, it is pretty run down. Wally Totten was sorry about that because in 1958 it looked quite different. At, uh, at that time my father kept it very much like a golf course. Uh, it was a, a wooden rail fence around the property. It was kept mowed and trimmed and we had horses and cows and, and that sort of thing. It was, it was a working farm but uh, very neat unlike the way you see it now. It breaks my heart to see it this way. Uh, I'm glad my father can't see it. Here, Victor and Walter Schauberger spent most of their time during their stay in Texas. They wrote letters and essays and drew project sketches. But the Americans seemed suddenly to have lost interest in them. In the first days and weeks, they were still very optimistic and full of confidence that the project would provide the breakthrough and that they would be successful here in the USA. As the weeks went by, and with nothing to do out here, the letters got more and more pessimistic. 
until a point was reached where it couldn't go on anymore. In the end, my grandfather signed a contract in which he transferred the rights to all his ideas, all his patents and thoughts to an American consortium, just so that he could fly back home again. And as you know, five days later, after he was back home, he died. I saw him as a man of great insight. In the 30s or even later, if people had listened to Viktor Schauberger, we would have been spared all the disasters we have today and which we're expecting to have. It cannot be different. Nobody could see the problems of life so comprehensively as he did. We cannot live without a living nature. That is quite clear. Victor's son, Walter, was an engineering graduate who tried to put together his father's empirical insights into a mathematical theory. He studied the monochord, a stringed instrument that Pythagoras played to make audible the harmony of the universe. When you cut a string in two, it sounds twice as high. When we now take a third of a string, it sounds three times higher. When we divide it into quarters, four times higher, and so on. From this pattern, my father, Walter Schauberger, derived his law of sound. For him, it was a universal law, the law of the universe. If one depicts this law graphically, one gets a hyperbola a curve that comes out of infinity and goes back into infinity. If we rotate the hyperbola around the y-axis, we get a hyperbolic cone. Walter Schauberger called it the tone tower. If we turn that cone upside down, we have a funnel, a hyperbolic funnel. We already know this funnel with its spiraling water vortex inside. In 1986, the funnel was produced. In August of the same year, Walter Schauberger conducted the first test runs with it. A stable pulsating structure develops out of a wobbling chaos. Walter Schauberger calls this vortex nature's energy program. It is controlled by frequency, this double helix, and instead of frequency, we say the number of revolutions. And then it's white at the bottom. Innumerable gas bubbles spiral around the plate in the center, a characteristic energy vortex pattern. In a natural river course, longitudinal vortexes form up like this. Walter's father, Victor, declared that this spiraling motion also appears in the three-dimensional helix around a hyperbolic cone. When it is cut along the diagonal, one obtains an oval section plane, which corresponds to a natural egg shape. As far back as 1609, the astronomer Johannes Kepler suspected that the planets moved in oval courses, but he described them as ellipses, because elliptical equations were already known back then. Thus, the hyperbolic cone, the tone tower, is a link between the harmony of Pythagoras and the astronomy of Kepler. Walter Schauberger summarized his mathematical theory under the term Pythagoras-Kepler system, known as PKS. For Walter, here in movie shots from the year 1972, the egg shape was the ideal form for technical equipment in which mixtures, solutions or emulsions can be produced. An egg-shaped reactor would offer new possibilities for energy generation, but a lack of money put an end to the trials. Walter Schauberger received many patents for spiraling treatment systems for fluid and gaseous media. One such machine was used at the Hamburg Waterworks in 1967. 
The department manager at the time, Gerhard Spreckelmeier, can still remember the tests. Schauberger's parabolic-shaped stirring machine was at the bottom of the tank. An underwater motor turned a propeller to produce a vortex. We tried to add chemicals to it, since the chemical balance in water is always tricky to manage. And we had good results. We welcomed Mr. Schauberger gladly, a well-rounded and open-minded man. We gave him the nickname Schlauberger, which means something like clever mountain man. So we carried out our tests here, but we didn't need them in the end, because we found other ways to adjust the chemical balance. Despite the success with the reduction of the chemical input, the Hamburg project ended ingloriously. The parabolic shaped bow was put to a different use, a two metre wide plant pot. Walter Schauberger was not only a bioengineer, but also an early environmental activist. In 1949, he founded one of the first environmental protection organizations in Austria, the Green Front. Reforestation was a priority. Schauberger maintained close contacts with the Men of the Trees in England and with the German Woodland Protection Association here at a meeting with the German president, Theodor Heuss. In 1970, Walter Schauberger founded the Pythagoras Kepler School PKS in Bad Ischl. The seminars and lectures aimed to promote natural technologies. The engineer and journalist Gottfried Hilscher was often a guest at PKS and was the first German author to describe Walter Schauberger's approach to energy generation. If a tornado was a machine, then it would not work. Because our textbooks tell us that we can't obtain propulsion energy from environmental heat. A tornado, however, obviously does exactly that. Nature's method of movement and energy generation is implosion, not explosion. That means suction instead of pressure, movement directed inwards, not outwards. Walter's wife, Ingeborg Schauberger, now an old lady, can still remember his brave words. Don't parrot what is explained in books in such detail, but think in the opposite direction instead. As the father had told his son, Walter, when it is about technology, you just have to think 180 degrees differently. Then it turns out right. In 1996, two years after Walter Schauberger's death, the seminars resumed. Among the first contributors and supporters were Kurt Lorek, Norbert Harthun and Uwe Fischer, Maximilian Mack, Konrad Richli and Wilhelm Martin. Ingrid and Jörg Schauberger have run the PKS seminars since the year 2000. In 2006, the English hydrodynamics researcher John Wilkes was a guest lecturer. He developed flow forms in which the water pulsates rhythmically over bowl-shaped cascades. They serve to enliven the water and are also artistic landscape architecture. Today, one such flow form is installed in front of the PKS villa in Bad Ischl. The form of the biotope is appropriate for a Schauberger institution, egg-shaped. The vision of the trout turbine. The concepts and applications of natural eco-technology are very wide-ranging and not yet fully explored. Jörg Schauberger's view. Victor and Walter Schauberger's insights should be seen as an invitation to be inspired. So the point isn't to stick to the literal meaning, but develop one's own ideas and thoughts for a future with and not against nature. Maybe we can add a third C to my grandfather's C and C motto. Comprehend, copy and cooperate with nature. Ottmar Grober in Styria has been cooperating with nature for a long time by building his river constructions which protect the riverbanks and vitalize the water at the same time. 
After he retires, Grober plans to develop a water power turbine. It is to be a bio-turbine according to Victor Schauberger's principles, which achieves a greater energy output without damaging the water and which lets the fish carry on swimming upstream. In Sweden, the Malmö Schauberger Group vitalizes numerous public and private ponds with its vortex systems, with visible success. Watrico's new super vortexer adds tiny air bubbles into the water and so produces almost the contrary of fog. Not small water droplets in the air, but air bubbles in the water. An efficient and promising method for aerating filter beds, for example. The Association of Implosion Research is going to conduct further repulsing tests with catalysts such as silica gel. Where this fisherman is standing, Felix Hediger's water vitalizing machine Belebula is making its maiden voyage. The pond, contaminated with algae, can take a deep breath now, after human intervention. For this water vitalizing machine, we need four pumps in all. We have developed our own pump. These pumps are designed to transport water in a correct, natural way. They don't smash up the water as conventional centrifugal pumps do. One can see that the rotor is screw-shaped and formed into a spiral. That is typical of the Schauberger way. To this extent, this pump is also inspired by Schauberger and Schauberger technology. The solar-powered pumps bring up cold water from a depth of three meters. First, it comes into vortex eggs, which have had minerals inserted. The water then rises further upwards in spiral pipes, and then either falls through a hyperbolic funnel or falls back on itself as a jet of water. But what would Victor Schauberger have said of this water-vitalizing machine? We don't know. But let the Austrian universal philosopher have the last word in this film. Wer hundert Jahre vorauslegt, der versteht die Gegenwart nicht und den versteht auch die Gegenwart nicht. Man spricht, man sieht die Dinge ganz anders. Man spricht eine Sprache, die den heutigen Wissenschaftler fremd ist. Und nun stellt sich im Laufe der, der Jahre in etwa so ausgereift, dass wir nun vor einer Alternative stehen, die wirtschaftlich, politisch, sozial und so weiter ungeheure Ausmaße annimmt. Ich behaupte sogar, dass dort das neue Entwicklungszeitalter auslöst. <lacht>